Welcome to Every Step Podcast. I'm Christina Weston. And I'm Judith Beck. Every Step is the podcast where career and life meet. With a new guest every episode, we explore the gutsy issues affecting everyone in the workplace. Today, we welcome Melo Calarco, mindfulness and high performance coach and author of Beating Burnout and Finding Balance. Welcome, Melo. Thank you. Nice to meet you and uh, great to be here today. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you here. With all the workplace changes over the last few years, it seems many people are battling with their mental health. We're seeing more absentee days or perception is that we're seeing more absentee days. Lower levels of productivity is a conversation that's being had around workplaces. And these are all symptoms of people not coping, not being in balance. It seems a really obvious thing to have balance to avoid burnout, but most of us, I know I am, we're pretty bad at it. Mm -hmm. What is burnout, Mello, and how does it differ from being stressed? Good question. It really is. And it's a question I get often asked around, am I stressed or am I burnt out? Like it's that obvious question people ask me quite often. The main difference that I'd say that differentiates it is stress is more like in simple terms, I'll put it in the most simplest terms, Stress is more like too much, too much, too much. And then as you're burning out, it's more like not enough, depleted, exhausted. And it's a bit of an evolutionary scale the way I see it in the work that I do. You know, there is everyday stress. Stress is good for us, by the way. We actually need stress to drive us, to motivate us, to help us achieve our goals. That's that's healthy stress. And if we're looking after ourselves and doing our self-care practices, that's a great zone to be in. I call that the green zone. So being in that green zone, it's healthy stress, that's good. Unfortunately, most people don't look after themselves on a daily basis and find balance daily, and it turns into chronic stress. And chronic stress is more like you know, that constant sort of overstimulation, overthinking, can't sleep at night, you've got adrenaline and cortisol going through the body. So the classic stress response is being switched on all the time. And that's that sort of yellow zone. People operate in that zone for a long time. Unfortunately, it might be months, years, even decades. You know, some some of the corporate people that I work with, it might not be you know, so obvious, but they're in that chronic stress zone for a long time. And for me, in the work that I do, I notice that the tipping point is that overwhelm and they're not looking after themselves. Then it turns down to the other side and that turns into distress. And distress is more like starting to feel tired. The, the term is, is called allostatic stress or allostatic load. And allostatic stress or allostatic load is basically this constant wear and tear on the body and mind in that chronic stress state is now wearing us out. So the language around that is like, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm unmotivated, I can't keep going like this. And that eventually leads to burnout. And burnout is dysfunctional. Typically, you can't do jobs that you normally could do. They're difficult and no longer being able to operate the way that you do. And that's total, absolute exhaustion. Yeah, most of us miss the signs along yeah. the way. What are, you know, if if I'm if I'm listening to this and I'm hearing elements of myself in your description, how do I know and how do I catch myself in that in that moment? Yeah, burnout is cumulative. And it, it is, it actually takes a while. Sometimes we don't even notice it until it's too late, most of the time, to be honest. You know, when I was actually interviewing for my book, you know, that you mentioned beating burnout, when I was interviewing for this, I interviewed about 200 people, leaders, um, executives, entrepreneurs, a whole range of diverse different backgrounds, and 90% of them didn't realise they were burning out until it was too late. And until it was some sort of critical sort of response or physiological response where it was a panic attack or they had to rush themselves to the doctor or whatever it was. So, yeah, you're not alone. Most people don't realise it. Or they realise it. The other the other 10% was they sort of realised something wasn't right, but they just ignored the signs anyway and just kept pushing on. Or they just didn't have the tools or techniques to actually, you know, get out of it or to to self-regulate. So the, the very first step is self-awareness is the very first step. So being aware, maybe I'm a bit straight. It could be the physical symptoms that you feel the most obvious first, maybe tight in the shoulders or tight chested or headaches and migraines, those very typical stress response signals and, and listening to that. So the very first step is that self-awareness. You can't change what you don't notice. So you have to notice it. And then the second step is actually doing something to self-regulate. 
So it's it's really like listening to the signs. So like I said, people often see the signs, but they just ignore them and they just keep going and going and going. And then eventually that end result is burnout or poor mental health. Is there a correlation between people who are burnt out, like they've gone, they go, I just can't do this anymore, with the results? Like in other words, um, if somebody... Is, are, is somebody more likely to be burnt out when results aren't coming in the door as opposed to someone who where the, the success is there, but they're burnt out too? Is there is there um, any kind of differentiation mm. between the two? There can be. and But what I do see, and especially with the high performers that I work with, high achievers and high performers, it's never enough. It doesn't matter what results they get. They just keep going and just keep pushing. And and just the worst case of burnout that I've ever seen, to be honest, is actually, you know, one of my clients actually who got referred to me by a doctor when he was fully burnt out already. Actually, he was very successful, you know, making plenty of money, uh, flying around the world, uh, very successful businesses, very successful companies. He was working across multiple time zones. So he was doing the UK, the US and Australia. Mm-hmm. And he almost wore it as a badge, like how busy he was and how successful he was and you know, working in the airport and then working in the in the airport lounges and then working on the aeroplane and working in L.A. when he got to L.A., you know, sometimes not even sleeping at all. So mentally, he was actually going you know, well and he, th- he thought that he was going well, but physically his body said, no more. I can't do this anymore. It actually shut down. Multiple organ shut down. His liver, pancreas, spleen started shutting down. He stopped producing hormones, um, has to physically still to this day rub testosterone cream on his body every day to actually survive. His circadian rhythm was totally out. The actual um, melatonin and serotonin doesn't know whether he was waking up or going to bed. So that's the worst case. So that's someone that's a high achiever and is getting results, um, but just doesn't know when enough is enough and to find that balance. And on the other end that you mentioned there, the you know people, people that are working hard and not getting the results, that also can be deflating and it it can be it can lead to burnout where they're not getting that sense of achievement that sense of purpose that sense of direction so they both correlate equally is is depression different to burnout or is it does it it come with burnout it does you, you can be depressed and not be burnt out yeah so they don't it's not necessarily but when you're in that burnout stage there are often mental health issues where it can anxiety, depression, and a whole range of you know, disorders can start manifesting, but then they can be independent also. Yeah, because you know, that that makes so much sense. And I think the, the first lesson that I ever learned, which was probably the best lesson that I learned um, back in when I was in my late 20s and I was working in um, banking, yeah. and that's where you really want to, you know, go fast and go get ahead. And back then, you know, the expectation was 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And yes. really, really, and I remember that and, and I had um, I had only been married a short time. And I remember my mother-in-law who lived close by. She was cooking our dinner for us every single night. And she'd come in and she'd make this beautiful dinner and then she'd tidy up the house. And I got annoyed. <laughs> And I'd go, well, doesn't she think I can cook? Doesn't she think I can clean? You know, <laughs> and, my, and, and, and somebody who I considered a mentor pulled me aside and said, what is your problem? Are you nuts? <laughs> if she wants to cook, give her the, or she wants to clean, give her the broom. If she wants to cook, give her the ingredients. Have gratitude because yeah. she is saving you so much. And, and it really was an eye opener. And it was really part of the journey of knowing that if people want to help you, Yes. Um, take the help because you can have it all, but you can't do it all. And and that's that's a problem that a lot of people have when they are doing too much. And and that could have. So if I would have had to go home and then cook and do the cleaning and doing all that, that would have just added to my initial um, stress and, that's I, right. and could have added to the burnout. And I'm always telling people, take the help. Yes. Take, delegate. And that's delegate. Not, well, delegate. Like, Delegate, del- and that's why I think it's so important for people to have coaches mm. because you need someone. Because that person I considered a bit of a coach, yeah. Um, and you need people who have a clear eye who can say, 
you know, something's not right with you, you know, yeah. why are you, that doesn't sound right. You should be thanking her, not being annoyed. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. That's a good point there too, Judith, where often the very first stages of burnout are actually those initial stages which are quite positive where you do work relentlessly hard to prove your worth in a new job or a new role or a new company and you just stay on that wheel and it just keeps going and going and going keeps escalating and then what happens you start letting go of other things work life balance self care practices and all of these things you know to prove that you are worthy as a you know new employee or new worker or new leader or new manager or new ceo and actually, then it's a, a downward spiral from there. So yes, reach out for help, get support, you know, put those um, ba- boundaries in place early for sure. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a real believer in this whole mind body wisdom. Mm. Um, but a lot of people say, oh, just listen to your body, but we don't actually teach people to do that. So I have conversations with a lot of people. I, I'm, I've been practicing mind body wisdom myself, and I'm I'm very attuned in terms of what's going on. And I've now learned to read what emotions I'm feeling emotions in my body, and I can ask it what it is and have a conversation with my emotional body. But that's been a learnt skill. And yeah. you were talking earlier. You know, if you just read the warning signals, if you just you know read the pain in the shoulder, or but most people think you and I right now are talking gobbledygook because <laughs> it's it's not something that is well understood. If we were to break it down into a teaching exercise, how would you teach someone a very simple practice to actually tune in? Yes, it's something that I teach all the time. I'm also an advocate for mind-body wisdom and have been, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by the actual correlation between the mind and the body. I've worked in mental health and psychiatric clinics for about 20 odd years, and I really learned the good, the bad, the ugly in there. And the correlation of the body and the mind is an area that I'm really passionate about. And I usually start off really simple. So I keep it as simple and applicable as possible. One of the very first things that I teach people when they start working with me is what I call that 90 second breath break. So 90 seconds, just stopping, just pausing and tuning into yourself, tuning into your body, tuning into your mind, tuning into the sensations present in the body, tuning into the emotions. And most people don't take on a meditation practice. They think, you know, 20 minutes is too long or 10 minutes is too long, but everybody has 90 seconds. And once you learn these 90 second breath breaks, you actually can punctuate your day with 90 second breath breaks. So anytime you're feeling a bit reactive or you've got too many windows open on your computer or you're feeling a bit stressed or you're feeling a bit tight or tense, just stop, pause, do 90 seconds of breathing and reconnect to the present moment through your breath as an anchor. So that's usually the first point that I use just to sort of stop and pause. Most people just distract themselves with more busyness or something else. So then they become even further detached from their body. So it's you know ignoring those signs. So that, that's the very first point. And once you learn that, basically, it's a tool that you have forever to self-regulate. So um, a, a quick story around that is um, I remember te- I, I teach this to thousands and thousands of people and one of the paramedics that I actually taught this to, he was out on site and he um, on an accident, got caught out to an accident and he opened up the back door and in the back door of the car was his son, you know, with lacerations and a teenage son, lacerations and cuts all over him. And um, he, to- he lost total cognition. So his amygdala hijacked him, you know, his fight and flight response hijacked him. He didn't know what to do, had no idea. And then he remembered that 90 second breathing practice and he started to breathe. He, he breathed deeper into his belly. He told me that he got to about the seventh or eighth breath and then he actually got cognition again, was able to think clearly and got help and, you know, his son survived and it's all all good. He's actually fine, but he thanks me endlessly for it. You know, a simple technique like that just to tune back into yourself, to get out of that reactive external stimuli and to tune in is very powerful. Yeah, and that's a habit, I think. We need to learn it and we need to make it a habit because I think we this. Many of us feel guilty when we stop, especially if we're high performers, high achievers. It doesn't matter whether we're entrepreneurs or in large corporate or whatever. Yes. It's almost a, a sin to stop. And yes. some of that's conditioning. Some of that's the way we've been brought up. Some, you know, It's a whole bunch of complex things. But we don't give ourselves permission because we have these maybe warped perceptions of, oh, we're going to 
I just push through, I'll get more done. Well, there's a whole bunch of science now that says your productivity actually decreases when you do that. So that's that's a big, that's a big myth. Or yeah. we're caught up in this guilt, or we're wanting, or we're we've got martyr syndrome and we've got to run around telling everybody how busy we are and how stressed we are because it gets a sympathy for whatever reason. You know, it's super complex. Exactly. Um, oh, yeah. Most people, you're right, 100 percent right. Most people, especially high performers, will not give themselves permission to stop. But I try to teach them that actually if you stop for two minutes or 90 seconds or five minutes, your next two hours will be more productive. So give yourself permission to stop and punctuate your day. And this is what getting onto that balance sort of story. If you can actually balance your day with periods of hard work, focused work, you know, cognition, decision making, problem solving, analytical thinking, and all those sort of things that you need in your job, and then you punctuate that with a little break you have another period of two hours. So you'll find balance in your day. So then at the end of the day, you won't be exhausted. You won't be tired because you're taking these little renewal breaks for the day and you still have energy for your kids and your family. And the other thing I'll say about that is actually people that are on that wheel of life and they're really sort of you know going high performance, especially you know, as they go up the ladder into those CEOs and leadership roles and they just keep going, going, going. Some people actually do not, like what they see when they stop they don't like themselves because they their work defines them yep. and i can't i can't tell you how many times i've done sessions for leadership teams or you know, even see groups of ceos that i often do and we do a 10 minute practice or a five minute practice and there's usually tears in the room there's usually people crying because they've actually finally stopped got off that busyness and they introspect a little bit and it's just too much for them sometimes because they don't usually process their thoughts and their feelings and they all just get overwhelming and, and too much. Yeah. So, Yeah, well, see, so what I, you're doing is you're, you're uh, developing corporate athletes. So yes. that rest and recovery mindset about if you want to be the best, you've got to train for it and you've got to have coaches and you've got to be able to recover. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best out of yourself. And I mean, these are things that, you know, we've all learned this because we've, we live the experiences, but the, the the generations that are coming up, it's important for them to hear that the work environment is like um, an environment where you do have to train. That's and right. it's not just about your brain, it's about your body, your beliefs and everything else. And, you know, I, when I look back at my career and I think of times when there were warning signs as not not an employee, but as an owner of a business, because the managers and the owners sometimes go into the business with a different mask on, mm. because they are the ones that need to be the cheerleaders and the 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 positive ones. But they could be having things going on themselves, and that is that's something that when I look back and I think, you know, I remember in 1999 I was going through divorce um, mm. through, with my uh, practice marriage. <laughs> And so my practice <laughs> marriage is 17 years. Right? But I look back now, and when I see photos, my hair was stressed. Mm. I, I My hair was thinner, and it was stressed, and it was from keeping everything internalized, going into the office, going, hello, everybody. <laughs> We're yeah. going to do great today. And, and keeping all that in inside. Yes. Um, Obviously, I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> but but those are the signs that um, we need to see in ourselves, but also in our employees. If someone comes into work, yes, you see them and they're not looking right, and you know they're not presenting themselves the way they used to. I mean, what do you do then? How do you handle that? Yeah, first of all, I like the term that you said around corporate athlete, uh, because you know high performers are corporate athletes. But the difference of a Corporate, a, a corporate versus an athlete is an athlete very well knows the benefits of recovery and renewal. And they actually do in their day have periods of active recovery and renewal, whereas a corporate often doesn't do that. So that's the first difference there that I say. And um, the other thing I'll say about that before I answer that question is um, when I when I am coaching high performance CEOs, executives and you know, entrepreneurs and a whole range of people, I actually don't use the term meditation or mindfulness because it can sort of scare them a little bit. And they think, oh, I'm, I don't need that. I don't need that stuff. It's going to slow me down. But actually, I use the language around 
performance or lose use the language around let's go train our attention or let's go reset or let's go refocus and when we put those terms into it you know it's more those high performance um, language then they're more likely to do it and then we do a meditation anyway it's just that it's, it's named something different so it actually gives them the tools that oh, they can important. actually op operate at their best yeah exactly yeah, language so, so, is so important so important, especially when you're in the mind body. If I walked in there and started talking about chakras and meridians and all that oh. sort of stuff, like, <laughs> what's this stuff, Milo? So, um, yeah, so that's that, that's what I'll say about that. And going back to your question there about sort of recognizing the signs there and sort of reading it and seeing it in your people there. So it is about, you know, especially if you know your team and you know the people that you work with when things are out of character. So if there's somebody in your team that's usually bouncy and bubbly and bright and alert usually and they just seem a bit flat or unmotivated you know it's worth checking in on them and vice versa someone that's normally maybe a bit sort of you know mellow excuse the pun you know sort of stable and they may be a bit more agitated and they may be a bit more anxious you know so the the signs to look for and this is the sort of three criteria to to recognize burnout is number one is that absolute depletion and exhaustion you know so they're just depleted and exhausted and the body language shows it. their energy levels show it different to stress or being stressed where a good night's sleep will fix that or a couple of good nights sleep or a weekend away will fix that but these just exhausted all the time doesn't matter how much sleep you get doesn't matter how much rest you're just exhausted so that's number one criteria number two is that detachment that feeling of detachment so being detached with your workplace with your colleagues with your people maybe a bit more cynical and negative than normal than they, they normally are maybe complaining about little things all the time or gossiping or moaning about the workplace so that's number two criteria and number three is that sort of lack of professional efficacy or efficiency so jobs that would normally be easy for them are really difficult you might give them a little job to do and they oh it's just too much i can't do it and it, they become reactive so that's the three criteria and that's exactly what the who talk about as the you know the three main criteria for burnout so if you're seeing any of those signs the first thing that i do is actually making sure that they're doing their own self-care looking after themselves first of all because usually burnout is cumulative lack of self-care so so making sure those basics are in place eating well sleeping well exercising taking renewal breaks meditation if they do all those things so having a little check in there and then if they you know are doing that that's fantastic you might see improvement and then if they're not and they're becoming worse then it might be time to refer you know to refer to um a specialist encourage them to maybe see a, a doctor or maybe the eap provider or some internal support that you have there so um hopefully that's answered that question um to some extent yeah yeah i think there's a greater there seems to be a greater responsibility on employers yes. to notice these days it was not something when I, when i was early in my career and judith was early in her career that we even talked about it mm. wasn't it wasn't discussed it was basically you know build a bridge get over it yeah. um, and we didn't we didn't go there it was like your work you came to work and we dealt with your productivity we didn't deal with all of you and it it now feels that employers have a greater responsibility um because it has economic benefits let's not yeah. be you know, yeah. let's not pretend there's no economic benefit to this, but it, it feels like we're being asked as leaders to have greater awareness of self and others and to learn skills and to put in place preventive measures that weren't our responsibility a couple of decades ago or a decade yeah. ago. Yeah. And on top of that, I'll say as leaders to role model good behavior and healthy behavior and healthy habits. You know, if you're a leader that you know comes in first thing in the morning and leaves late last at night, never takes breaks, doesn't look after themselves, doesn't exercise, doesn't do those things, you know, you're role modeling the wrong behavior and that spreads out as a contagion across the workplace. So if you're a leader that does you know, look after themselves, you know, take the afternoon off occasionally to be with a family or do some things for themselves or, you know, takes renewal breaks for the day. That's a great thing to do. And um, and sometimes even show their own vulnerability and uh, authenticity and humanness to them to, to themselves. We're, we're not machines, we're people and we struggle. You know, everyone struggles with pressure and anxiety or one of the most powerful campaigns I've ever seen in one of the companies that I work with is when one of the top leaders in the company um, made a one-minute video about his struggle with anxiety. 
and um, and they shared it across the whole company. It's three hundred or five hundred in the company. I can't remember exactly, but they shared it the whole company, and everybody was like shocked. Oh my god, I didn't realize that he was actually struggling with anxiety. But once they shared that video, it opened up the conversation for everybody to feel safe to speak up, for everybody to actually talk about you know their struggles and problems so it is very powerful as a leader it's not a sign of weakness to show that it's actually a sign of st- strength i believe do you think do you think it's more common do you think mental health and burnout is a bigger issue today than it was a number of years ago or are we just talking about it more i think both i think the pandemic definitely had a, a an effect on that so it drove we were heading into burnout anyway but it just drove it a lot quicker i know that people you know, I did a lot of work with the pandemic um, over the period of 18 months or two years where I supported over 70,000, 75,000 people globally with seminars and workshops. And I followed the mental health of it quite closely where being working in mental health clinics. And initially there was a lot of that you know, anxiety and fear and uncertainty. And then there's a fair bit of depression and loneliness and you know, isolation. And then as the lockdowns continue, there was also that sort of post-traumatic sort of stress and all those sort of things that come through it you don't suddenly come out of a pandemic like that and everything's fine again like it was quite taxing on our mental health resources so I think that really drove a lot over the edge in many ways and um but naturally anyway the world's getting faster you know information's getting faster we're taking in more information we're overloaded the always on, always accessible um, thing is also another thing that's causing it. So we're heading in that direction. In Australia, we're pretty good about talking about mental health, I, I believe. We have you know, Beyond Blue and Black Dog Institute and a whole range of great foundations and organisations that open the conversation. Um, so it is probably more prevalent and we're probably noticing it more because we do talk about it more um but i do think it is on the rise yeah, definitely i do sit so, uh, usually in my coaching work let's say five years ago i'd meet more people in the chronic stress zone so they're more like stressed and that's normal they're working hard there might be surgeons that are working crazy hours or you know executives that are working crazy hours so it's in that chronic stress zone in the yellow zone so it wasn't far for me to get them back to the green zone to the everyday stress zone but now i must say i'm meeting more people in the orange and red zone than I ever have before. Mm. So they're fully and how can out. somebody how can somebody who's in that zone get themselves out of it? Like in the in the or in the orange the red high, zone? Yeah, in the high zone. How can they because often we don't recognize it ourselves. No it's like we're not recognizing with the hair thing. I didn't recognize it until I looked back at pictures. Yeah. It's more so um, how 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 could as a you know especially owners because owners of businesses yeah tend tend to just keep going 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 and they tend to put it like I said a, a mask yeah. on yeah um, you know how can they recognize it and get and and get themselves out of it because it sounds like it's that it, there's a differentiator between passion because if you're yes. passionate about your business you work hard you work hard you work hard you take everything on then you get high level of stress and you might be burning out because of the activity level yes and then there's the burnout of i just can't do this anymore and i don't like it yes <laughs> just, exactly you know, but but financially i'm tied to it so i have to keep because i have a economic obligation to to continue how does someone like yeah switch the switch switch the the um flip the switch yeah yeah it's very different in you if you're in those end phases so if you are burnt out it's very different to someone in those sort of earlier phases of the sort of yellow zone chronic stress so when it's in those earlier phases it's more preventative putting in some preventative measures so we don't actually tip over the edge when it's in those red phases of fully burnt out and poor mental health then it's almost like rehabilitation actually it's almost like recovery what do i need to do to recover so if i meet someone in that zone it's like okay let's make sure we start putting things back in place first of all creating boundaries between work and home second of all you know looking at what i call the wheel of life so the wheel of life is that work life balance which has sort of eight domains of different areas of your life and reclaiming them you know, anything from health and fitness to obviously work and career, you know, to, you know, financial well-being, to hobbies and interests, to personal development, to getting some downtime. So I look at those and what I do with my clients usually is we grade them 
you know, how, how is your health and fitness at the moment? And it might be a two. And someone that's passionate going on to what you're talking about, the passionate worker there, especially if they're a business owner, like myself, I'm, I'm in the same situation. We might be nines and tens in the work career stuff in our work, but we're, we're twos and threes in other areas because there has to be a cost to that. So it might be our relationships. It might be our social relationships also. So the very first thing I say is actually let's have a look at that and let's reclaim some of those things. Let's reclaim that family support, that social support. Let's re reclaim our health and wellness. And sometimes it goes back to like when somebody is really burnt out, but basic fundamentals, like absolutely walking, exercising, all those sort of things there. So putting that plan in place isn't it it's putting that, yeah you know that corporate athlete plan in place and I mean I always say to people I've never come up with a great idea in within four walls it's always been in fresh air yes yeah it's always been when I'm out walking and I go aha okay I'll call it that oh I'll do it that you know that's where all of a sudden your brain just frees up and you you just start thinking Yes. Rather than sitting in front of your computer, I got to quickly come up with this idea. You know, fresh air, fresh air ideas. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know why that is? Why? Because when you're operating in the four walls, let's say in your office and you're working away, you're in what's called beta state. So the brain, the brain frequencies are working in beta. Beta is your brain is oscillating at 14 to 40 hertz. You know, it's thinking, it's planning, it's problem solving, it's decision making, it's doing all those things. There's no capacity for creative thought when you're in that mode. But when you go for a walk and you sort of slow down out of that busyness, you drop down into those deeper states, which are called alpha and theta. And then, then your brain slows down and it goes to another level. It might be down to like 7 to 14 hertz. And in that space, we create space for creative thought to come up. A lot of people say, I just went for a walk and oh, got this great idea. Or even they go have a shower or go to the bathroom and they come out of the bathroom and say, I just got this great idea because they've dropped out of that beta state and they've dropped into this slower frequency, which is exactly what meditation does also, drops you into this slower frequency. And that's where the, the truth comes out. That's where the wisdom comes out. That's where the creativity comes out. Einstein puts it really I well. I get it. Well, yeah. you know what? You, you know what, Mella? The bathroom is not the, the bathroom. It's the library, according to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say a quote by Einstein. He puts it really well where he says, I think 99 times I find nothing. I stop. I swim in the silence and the truth comes. So sometimes we have to stop. Sometimes we have to pause. And so when it comes to work-life balance, it is about punctuating your days with pauses. It is about stopping, going for gentle walks. Do something that fills up your cup. Do something that makes you feel good You know, to get those resources back there. We're not machines. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> no, I, I love I love that. I think I think at the end of the day, um, you know, you ha you can't. You're right. We're not machines. You have to be able to have that balance in a in a, a work environment. Mm. I think it's going to be harder though. I think with people working from home so much for for managers to identify issues. Yes, but also. I wonder whether or not people who are working from home all the time are are working continually yeah. and not taking those breaks and how yeah. that's going to affect them. Where, you know, when we were at work and we were we had time we we were walking from the um the train to to the work and back, and then we walked down to go get a coffee. We sometimes would go for lunch. Go with for lunch, yeah. Like we yeah. were outside, and sometimes. And I, I know when I had my business in Melbourne, we would do walk and talks. Yes. So we would go around, and we would get it, and we'd get a coffee, and we would do walk and talks, or we'd go down to the um, a little park, and we'd have a yeah. meeting there. So I, I wonder how that. Have what are you seeing in that in that case? Yeah, you're right. Exactly. The hybrid workplace has, you know, affected us in many ways. And and the main thing is those those boundaries. So it is about creating. We are social animals, essentially. We actually need people around us to develop ourselves, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all those things. We actually need people. So at work, you might do exactly that. You might pop up from a period of busy work and you go chat with somebody or you go for a walk with somebody, you go have a coffee with somebody. So we need that. Unfortunately, at home, 
we're just isolated. You know, we might have Zoom meetings and team meetings, but they're very intentional and they're very meeting based and they're exhausting. They actually are really resource heavy on us and we don't have those renewal breaks or we just think, I'll just power on and keep going. And one of the biggest problems that I see is actually people that have finished their work day. And like you said before, usually the commute home will be the transition, but they don't have that commute home to get home, whether it's driving home or walking home or, you know, catching a train. So they just, they're still on in their mind and they're not even present at home with their family. And then they think, oh, after dinner, I'll just quickly check my emails after dinner, just see what's going on. And then before you know it, it's after dinner and it turns into seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, and they're working until 11 o'clock. And then they can't go to sleep at night because they're thinking about their work and they're overstimulated and they're wound up and it just has this perpetual downward cycle. So it is about creating boundaries, first of all, around Am I home or am I at work? And one of my clients has a really good method there. He 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 did this himself during the, especially during the pandemic when it was happening. Um, because he was always working at, at the workplace. He's a, a leader manager in a company. So when he was working from home, what he did was actually he at the end of the day, he'd actually get his jacket and his satchel with his laptop in it, and he'd walk around the block and he'd come home hang up the the thing on the hook, his jacket on the hook, hang up his laptop and says, okay, that's it. Like, honey, I'm home sort of thing because that's what he always used to do. So he needed to physically have that boundary and that barrier. Ritual. Yeah. yeah. It's, really it's a important. ritual, exactly. Ritual. And, it te- and it tells your mind you're off. And another client of mine actually also, he literally got his laptop and all his papers, put them in one of those big plastic tubs, you know, with the clips on it, take it out in the garage, put it in the garage and then give the, give the key to his wife and say, don't let me actually work anymore after hours. So sometimes you have to put those really clear boundaries. Um, I I personally, what I do at the end of my workday is I actually get changed. I say, okay, that's the end of my workday. I physically change out of my work clothes or my shirt or whatever it is. And I put on my casual clothes. It's a signal to me that says I'm winding down, but it's also a signal to my family that says, hey, he's home now, like he's actually, he's not working anymore. So whatever it is that you can do to create some simple boundaries, I think is the best uh, strategy. So our solution is get a a dog or dogs because our dogs come and go, it's time. Exactly. It's time time." and they're, they're, they're clock perfect. They know exactly what time it is. And then we have to go for a walk or go outside and that's, that's the that's great. So they know better than we know what's good for us. <laughs> exactly. They're the best accountability buddy. I have a very big uh, Swiss shepherd, a big white shepherd. Ooh. His name's Coda. And he comes around about five o'clock-ish. Yep. Hey, hello, it's time for a walk. Yeah, half past four, uh, five o'clock. It's like, yeah, they know. Exactly. You've had enough. It's time now. <laughs> That's exactly. fantastic. And speaking of time, we are coming to the end of our time. Yes. <laughs> So before, just to wrap this up, I'd like it if everybody could just share what they personally do to re-energize and to get back on track when you're personally feeling a little close to burnout. Um, Let's start with you, Mello. Yeah, first of all, I make those preventative measures, actually. So my non-negotiables that are not negotiable every single day is I get up quite early, I get outside, I take the dog for a run or a walk outside to get that fresh air and that serotonin production. And then I do a meditation practice that actually you know, sets me up for the day, gives me that focus and that stillness, getting ready, and a healthy breakfast. So three wins before the day started, that's just for me. I'm not checking my emails. I'm not checking my telephone. I'm not doing any of that. So I, my, my golden rule is the first thing I do in the day is for me. It's not for anybody else. So I can then serve better and coach better and do my seminars and workshops better. And the other golden rule is I ask myself this one question every single day. And this one question is, what have I done for me today? You know, what have I done that's just for me? What have I done that fills up my cup? What have I done that fills up my resources so I can prevent burnout happening in the first place? So that's mine. That's, yeah. And that doesn't mean having a piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe occasionally, maybe occasionally. <laughs> Christina, how about you? Um, I think for me in terms of that whole preventative piece, and this has been a a journey that I've been for a long time, so it hasn't happened overnight, is that I've learned to listen to my body and I've learned something we were talking about early. I've learned about my mind-body wisdom and our our bodies are and our minds or our spirits, however you want to language it, are really clever, but we ignore it. We ignore it. 
Um, and I've also learned to understand and name my emotions and differentiate and actually be able to call the emotion, lean into it, and then it seems to disappear. And I know these concepts sound a little maybe strange, but learn to listen to your body and don't be afraid of your emotions. Initially, when you lean into your emotions, it's scary. It is really scary. And you think you're standing on the edge of a cliff and you think you're going to fall over with no, with no safety net. But the reality is that you actually feel better. So there's a whole bunch of counterintuitive stuff. So yeah, listen to your body, yeah. learn to name your emotions. It'll yeah. help you. It'll help you. Oh, love that. Yeah. And what what I would say is, I mean, what I personally do is, is one I um, when I'm feeling bogged down or there's a lot of stuff going on, I I do a reevaluation. So I because all all of a sudden by the end of the week you can get all this stuff all over your desk and all yes. this stuff and everything. And so I like to do what I call regroup and reevaluate what has to be done. That actually mm. energizes me. Yeah. But, <laughs> physically, but physically, I make sure that I'm not sitting in my chair for more than 30 minutes and then I get up out of my chair because I'm I work from home and I'm not used to working from home because I like being out there in front of people and out there and I like that better but I've been working from home as everybody else has been so I make sure I get up and I have a break and it might be for a walk or and that's um that's something I do all the time and the I always do what you do mellow I dress for work yeah. so I I I don't come to my office with my track pants on. <laughs> type yeah. thing, you know, I want to feel like uh, you know that that sort of um, the day. I want to feel like the day uh, is special. Yes. And, um, and I turn my phone off at five thirty, and I do not turn it back on until um, eight o'clock the next morning. And and that is tough. That mm. is actually tough to do. Um, but once you do it, it it becomes a habit. You don't need it. You know, you don't need it. And you don't use your phone for your social media stuff. Like if you do want to look at stuff or or whatever socially, you don't go on, use the same device because you'll be tempted to check your emails and things like that. Yes, yes. So that, that keeps me sort of um, energized. And yes. um, I think you have to have the break, especially from working from home. So thank you. We could really, really go on so much of there's so many um, fascinating things to, to talk about. And I hope everybody goes out and gets your book. Would you like to show it again? Because I love product promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Beating burnout and finding balance. So go out and get a copy because I my guess is there's not one person who's listening right now who couldn't benefit from that. Yes, I can. I can share if you like. I can share a free sample chapter. I can uh, share a link that actually can give you a free sample chapter that people can just try before you buy, sort of thing. And and the sample chapter is actually chapter one, which is about a, a self awareness, and it's actually about a situation where I had to meditate for twelve hours to survive a storm that I got caught in. So it's probably a good entry point. So I can share that with with all oh, your listeners out there. We'll make it available on our website. We yes. love free stuff. So <laughs> not a problem. But and also to the people out there, don't wait till it becomes a problem. Exactly. With your, with your self-development and, and your um journey through your career, start things early. Don't let this become a problem. Things like Mello's book will help you through your whole career. And my guess is you'll be flipping through it, you know, off and on yep. for years. Yes. And that's 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 what you know you that that's where you kind of got your self help there right in front of you so go out and get it and thanks again mello we really really had a lot of fun thanks mello thank you thank you thank you for having me and thank you everybody out there for more information about every step and our guests head to everysteppodcast.com to be notified of new podcasts please subscribe via your favorite listening platform and of course, follow us on social media and direct message us to share your ideas about guests or topics.